I'm going to start talking about functions in Python. Let's start off with something really, really simple, which is this. Let's say I have s equals a, b, c, d. Right, and s equals a, b, c, d, so I'm creating a string. All right, fine. Um, and let's say I want to get the uh, length of the string. Well, of course, I could say len of s. Len of s is going to give me 4. This is not much of a surprise. And I can say x equals len of s. And then if I say, what's the type of x? Well, I've gotten an integer back. And if I say, what is the value of x? Then I've gotten 4. So, you know, all that's very good and very nice and everything. This should not come as a surprise. But what if I do something a little different? What if I say here, x equals s dot upper? Well, of course, x is going to be now a, b, c, d in big letters because I've run the upper method on s. So far, again, not much of a surprise, and the type of x is string. But what if I say x equals s dot upper just like that? Is this even going to work? And it turns out that, yes, it'll work. We didn't get an error message, at least. But what is x? x, it turns out, is a reference to the function. And this is super, super important. Right here in line four, when I said x equals s dot upper parentheses, the parentheses basically say I want to execute the function or the method in this case. Without the parentheses, we don't get an error, but we get a reference to the method. So x and s dot upper are exactly the same thing. In fact, I can ask is x is s dot upper, and that's gonna oh well it's gonna be fall oh because of the methods fine fine, fine fine never mind that but they are both referring to the same method object just because of some match going on behind the scenes. So if I want to, I can say s dot upper, and I get parentheses there, and I can say x parentheses. Why am I showing this to you first off, right off the bat? The point was here that functions in Python are objects. They are objects. They are nouns. They are not just verbs. So we can pass functions around, and we're going to see some of this later on. But basically, the idea is here that if I use parentheses with a function, I'm executing the function. I want its result. And yet, when I don't use parentheses, I'm just treating it as a noun. And let me show you where I see this most often in my courses. So it's when people create a dictionary, a1, b2, c3. By the way, I don't think I introduced myself. I'm Ruben Lerner, uh, I do Python training, and uh, I wrote uh, a Python workout uh, with Manning, and I do training all around, and all sorts of other good stuff. Okay, enough about me. For, uh, let's say here, key value in the items, print, and you can say here, key, value. And sure enough, we're going to iterate over D items. We're going to get the key and the value. We're going to print the key and the value. All is good. This is not where I see people having problems. Where I see having problems is when they do this. They forget to put the parentheses here. So what does this mean? Well, in this original for loop, for turns to the result of running d.items and says, hey, are you iterable? And the answer is yes, because the result of d.items is an iterable data structure. And so for says to it, okay, give me your next and your next and your next, and that's what we get. By contrast, here the for loop is turning to d.items, the method, and it says, are you iterable? And the answer is, no way. Built-in function or method object is not iterable. Now, this error message drives people bananas because they don't understand what it means. What it basically means is, hey, Bozo, you forgot to include parentheses. You are trying to iterate over the function object itself. You're not trying to iterate over the result of invoking the function. And that distinction between the function object and invoking the function is actually a pretty big one. So with that in mind, let's now define our own function and see how we can play with this and what we can do. So I'm going to say here, def hello. I'm going to say here, return. Actually, let's even do that. Yeah, sure, return hello. Very simple function. What just happened when I said def? What just happened? Two separate things. Number one, I created a new function object. Number two, I assigned it to the variable hello. That's right, there are no separate namespaces in Python for functions and for data. It is one namespace, and that namespace is used for everything. So a variable can refer to a string, or an integer, or a list, or a tuple, or to a function. So if I say here, what's the type of hello? It says function. That is actually like, you know, a function object. Okay, well, why do I care? Why do I care? that it's an object. Well, just as we saw before, it's a noun, it's not just a verb. We're going to see how we can use this in a bunch of places. By the way, we just saw how we can use it right here in the type function. I passed hello the function object to type. If I had said type of hello parentheses, what would have happened? Then we would have been passing the string. We would have run the function hello, and the string that we get back would have been passed to type, and we would have gotten string. 
right? Which is not the case. I mean, it's the type of what the hello function returns, but it's not the type of function itself. What's going on behind the scenes here? When we define our function, I said before, we create a function object and then we're, um, we're assigning it to a variable. But what does this mean, this function object? What does it mean that Python is creating it? It turns out that Python is a compiled language. Many people don't realize this. They think it's all an interpreted language, but that's not the case. Python is byte compiled, just like Java and C Sharp. The byte codes aren't quite as smart. The compiler is not quite as smart. That's often on purpose um, so that you can have a very clear one-to-one -one correspondence between them. But absolutely positively, our function is compiled. Let's take a look at it. I'm going to import this. Not to be confused with import this, but import this imports the disassembly system in Python. And I can say dis.dis .dis of hello of my function. And let's take a look at what it says here. There are two bytecodes in this function. This is what Python is actually seeing when it executes our function. Load a constant and return that value. So it's loading the constant string hello, one. Why one? We'll see that in a moment. And then it returns that value. This is our function. That's great. And you can actually go and look through any function. We're going to look through a few more and see how they are turned to bytecodes. But where is this stored? Where is this information stored? Well, it's stored on the function object. But where on the function object? Well, it turns out that every object in Python has attributes after the dot. And function objects have this thing called dunder code. This is the brains of our function, or the heart of our function, or the you know, kidneys of the function, whatever you want to call it. This is where it's at, this code object. And if we look at it, it says, oh yes, this is a code object, hello, at, that's the address, and even tells us what file it was written in and what line it was in, which is, of course, inside of Jupyter, so it's not really that exciting. So now what? Well, I can look inside of there and say, hey, dir of hello dot thunder code. Show me what's there. And there are all sorts of different attributes. And then we have the CO attributes. And these are where it's actually interesting. These are the hints that Python has left for itself when it wants to execute a function. So when I say, hello, parentheses, what happens? Well, it actually executes our code here. CO underscore code, those are the byte codes. If I say here, hello dot thunder code dot CO code, there we go, byte codes. Look at how many there are. One, two. Actually, I think it's two. There might be some like extra thing in there as well. It's a byte string. And so these are our byte codes. Fantastic. But wait a second. We know that there's got to be more to it than that because when we disassemble their function, we saw that it was referring to a constant, a constant hello, that string that we had in our function. Where is that? Well, all these other CO attributes contain the information we're looking for. For example, CO, or I guess it's hello, code, CO, constants. Oops, sorry, con, CO, con, oh, consts. And there are two of them. The first one is none. None is always, absolutely, positively, always the first constant. It's always at index zero. Hello, where did this come from? Well, when our function was compiled, when our function was compiled, Python noticed that we had this string there. It stuck the string into consts, and then it just refers to it. So if I say dis.dis .dis of hello, once again, I'm passing hello as an argument to dis.dis. .dis. It's loading constant number one. What if I were to do this? What if I were to say here, def, you know, add nums, and I'm going to say no, no uh, arguments, and then I'm going to say here, return two plus three plus four. Well, if I say now dis.dis .dis of add nums, look at what we have. Oh, okay, I guess it's going to do it inline. Fine, so let's do it, make it a little smarter. I'll say here x equals 2, y equals 3, z equals 4. All right, and then we can say here, return x plus y. It might actually optimize this, but I'm sort of doubtful. There we go, okay. So what do we have here? It's going to load the constant. We're going to get to the store fast and load fast in just a moment. We're going to load the constant at index 1, load the constant at index 2, load the constant at index 3. And indeed, if I now say, hey, what's add nums? code, co const, look at that. We have constant 1, 2, and 3, and none is still going to be at index 0. This is how Python takes your code, breaks it apart into bytecodes and constants, and then it just refers to those from within the code. That's pretty nifty. So let's talk about arguments, actually. Actually, no, before we even do that, watch this. If I say here def hello, I'm just going to rewrite this, right, and return hello. So that has a dunder code object. What if I say def goodbye? 
each of these functions has a Dunder code object. It has that code object that was compiled. Now you can't actually change a Dunder code object. So I can't say goodbye code and then like co const equals and I'll just say here like, you know, none and ha ha ha. You can't go do that. It's a read only attribute. But you can say goodbye code equals hello code. And this is what I call a function brain transplant. Because what have I done? I've said that hello code and goodbye code have the same code object. Meaning that when I say hello, hello. And when I say goodbye, hello. I think there's a song like that. You say goodbye and I say hello. This is where they got the inspiration. Okay, perhaps not. In any event, you see that these are just objects that we can like play with and you know, mess around with wherever we want. But the fact is you're not typically going to be directly modifying these code objects or even trying to, and even this sort of brain swapping, as I like to call it, right, is not something you're going to want to do in production. But let's dig into a little more understanding our functions and how they work. Let's say I call hello world. Python's not going to like that. Python's going to say, wait a second, hello takes zero positional arguments, but one was given. All right, so my first question is, what is a positional argument? And how did it know? Right, how does it know? So there are two types of arguments. Let's two types of arguments in Python. There are positional arguments, right? And these are assigned to parameters via their, big surprise, position. And then we also have keyword arguments. And these are assigned to parameters via their names, keywords. Right, so if I say here, def add of x and y, right? And I just say return x plus y. So if I now say add of 10 and 5, I now have, you know, both of these are positional arguments. Why? Because based on their positions, they're going to be assigned to x and y. And it works great. But I can also say add x equals 10, y equals 5. And now both of these are keyword arguments. And they're going to be assigned based on their names. Now keyword arguments are sort of, you know, more, they're more fun. They're more flexible because I could say, of course, add y equals 5 and x equals 10. Don't do that because you will have no friends. But it will actually work. It'll be totally fine. So let's go back now to hello world where I tried to call it. And it said, no, it takes zero position arguments. To which I say, how do you know? Who told it? The code object, of course. If I say hello code, and now I say co arg count, co arg count is zero. So when I try to call the function, Python checks how many arguments are we supposed to pass. The number is zero. It says I got one. It complains. It throws us an error, raises an exception. Okay. How can we change this? Well, we're going to define our function again. Def hello name return. Hello, name. Now, there are languages in which if you define a function a second time, it has a different signature, a different number of arguments, then you've defined the function twice, and the language will figure out which one of these should be handled. Not so in Python. Remember, when I use def, what's it doing? It's creating a function object and assigning to a variable. So I have now overwritten, I have trampled on the previous definition of hello. So don't think that when I defined hello here a second time, now we've got like two versions of hello running around. We don't. The previous version is gone. So now I can say, right, hello of world, and it works fine. How does Python know? Well, I can check here. I can say, hello, oops, hello, under code, COR count. And sure enough, it knows that it should take one argument. And if I say, hello, nothing, it says, you're missing a required position argument. And then it even tells us which one. It's called name. Once again, how did it know? And once again, the answer is the code object. Hello, code, co var names. Co var names is a tuple of strings with the function's local variables. And there we go, name. So here's what's going on. Parameters are actually local variables. So when I say def hello name, Python knows that this parameter is a variable and it sticks it in two CO var names as part of the compilation. It then knows that this is an argument. So arg count one means that that first, right, basically it always counts from the left there. So the first one local variables will be a parameter. What if I do this? What if I say here def hello name? And then I say here x equals one and y equals two. And then I say return hello name. 
Well, now if I say hello code co var names, we're going to have name and x and y. Notice though, name is still first. So when we look at hello code co arg count, that's going to be one. So we know that this is a parameter and these are just plain old local variables. Yes, for the previous one, so, so, uh, uh, Sorry, not to try to pronounce your uh, username. Shalom says the previous one will be cleaned by garbage collection. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so our previous version of hello, when there are zero, zero references to it, the garbage collector will eventually uh, free it up. So we don't need to worry about that memory and all that other stuff. It is possible, especially in a Jupyter-type environment, that someone is holding on to a copy of it or a reference to it. I don't think so, but it's possible. But certainly in most normal circumstances, it will be cleaned up by garbage collection. Yeah, absolutely.